This lecture will cover the nervous system infections. So the nervous system consists of two major parts, the peripheral nervous system as well as the central nervous system. So your peripheral nervous system inputs and transmits information. Um, it is composed of various nerves, whereas the central nervous system, um, it integrates information received, sends back with an action plan, and is composed of the spinal cord and the brain. So this is where your signal transmission happens. The nervous system contains no um, normal microbacteria, no normal microorganisms. Um, so anything that is found within the central nervous system is considered to be abnormal. And so within the central nervous system, you actually have spinal fluid that um, acts as a cushion around the brain and the spinal cord. And so um, it is one of the areas that can be um, a risk for infection. So the blood-brain barrier is actually um, a very unique system of specialized blood vessels that will do an exchange of nutrients and oxygen to the central nervous system. But then it will also prevent any sort of organism from entering into this sterile environment. Although there are, you know, some virulence factors that allow bacteria to cross over this barrier. Viruses have a little bit more of an easier time actually invading the central nervous system, but they do encounter some challenges with that. So nervous system infections are more likely to follow some type of injury to the actual central nervous system. And then, um, they can also develop as if there's some sort of other problem with the immune system that allows them to be able to cross over and invade that blood brain barrier. So the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system can actually become infected when there's some sort of defense breakdown. So when we look at these, we're looking at meningitis versus encephalitis. So meningitis or the meninges is the actual membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And so usually this infection is due to some sort of viral component, but you do also have some bacterial um, organisms that can cross over and cause an issue with that meninges within those meningeal layer. Um, so with viral infections, you can have fever, headaches, stiff neck, um, nausea, sensitivity to light, vomiting. Um, with bacterial, you have some of the same symptoms, but you can also exhibit um, more of like a bacterial infection type symptoms with aches and chills, rash. With encephalitis, the brain um, this is actual infection of the brain. When the spinal cord is also involved, it's called the encephalomyelitis. And so here we're just going to focus mostly on the encephalitis, but it's usually viral. And so this can be something like the herpes simplex virus 1 or the arbovirus, like West Nile virus, that are the more common causes of this type of infection where it actually infects around the brain. And then you can also have some. Uh, bacterial um, infections as well as very rarely some different fungi and parasites that will cause encephalitis. So with this you can have fever, headache, um, and sometimes it can be followed with uh, disorientation, abnormal behavior, seizures. And so to diagnose these of course you would need to do a lumbar puncture and evaluate that spinal fluid um, some cases there may be imaging that is performed. Um, so with a viral infection, there's really um, no great way to treat this. Most patients are able to recover on their own. Um, but treating symptoms um, and ruling out a bacterial infection is usually more of how um, these types of infections go. 
And with your bacterial infections, of course, there are some antibiotics that kind of help to prevent this. Um, but treatment with antibiotics is what you would do, depending on the particular organism and the antibiotic that uh, will treat that particular organism. And so with bacterial infections, you do want to diagnose it pretty quickly. Um, with viral forms of meningitis, they can be very seriously, but they're usually a better prognosis than an actual bacterial infection. Um, with the peripheral nervous system infections, you know, these aren't as common, but this is where the viruses will actually hide inside their neurons and cause flare-ups of the actual infection. And so symptoms are rarely neurological and um, therefore they're not really considered nervous system types infections. And so with these infections within the peripheral nervous system, you have pathogens that produce toxins that can cause um, the actual peripheral nervous system to have issues. So the viruses are very small, which allows them to be able to cross that blood brain barrier. Um, some of the ones that we're going to look at will be polio, rabies, and um, West Nile virus. So with polio, um, pretty much has been eradicated with the use of vaccines, um, but you do still see it a lot in um, other countries. And so most of the times these patients will present with flu-like symptoms. Um, with polio, it can actually attack the central nervous system with the spine and the brain, which can lead to muscle weaknesses, paralysis, um, and then um, with recovery, the patient can actually have um, issues due to the neurons actually being destroyed by the virus itself. And so to detect this, you could do PCR testing where you're actually looking for the viral messenger RNA. Um, and treatment for this type of infection can actually be a very long treatment. It can take up to two years to treat this infection. Rabies um, is transmitted through an animal bite with an infected um, animal or through breathing in the aerosol droplets. So within the U.S., the most common reservoir is going to be that skunks, raccoons. And then, of course, you know, they can um, infect your pets and then you can become infected from your pets as well. It, signs and symptoms include fever, headache, disorientation, uh, fear, having an actual fear of water, excessive salivation, hallucinations, and partial paralysis. So the virus can actually enter the muscle cells and it will replicate slowly and then it will actually eventually travel to the peripheral nervous system and it will also invade the central nervous system. Um, but those toxins that are released, it has various uh, proteins, the G protein, which will help with uh, adhesion of the virus to the actual cell and to be able to penetrate it. So detection is um, usually going to happen after patients being uh, suspected of being bitten by an animal that possibly has um, that has this particular infection, this organism. And you're typically going to do some sort of PCR testing where you're actually looking for um, this organism. However, if if the patient doesn't survive, then there are certain things that they can see on autopsy. When they're looking at the brain tissue um, to actually you know, determine that this was a cause of death. West Nile virus, um, again, is transmitted from birds to humans via mosquito or tick bites. So you do um, this is one of those things that's tested for with blood um, 
blood donations now. Uh, they do look for West Nile virus being present in blood donations. Signs and symptoms include fever, headache, flu-like symptoms, meningitis, as well as encephalitis. And this is typically going to be tested for using an antibody-based method, um, as well as PCR-type testing to look for this organism. And to treat this organism, you're basically going to treat the symptoms. So with a suspected infection of the central nervous system, if you're going to do a spinal tap, what you're looking for from that lumbar puncture to determine the bacterial versus viral. Because remember, you, you're going to have to treat this pretty quick. So patient coming in with just symptoms is not always going to tell you what the patient is infected with if you're suspecting some sort of meningitis. Um, so doing a spinal tap to get that spinal fluid, some of the things that you're looking for would be um, a high pressure release upon puncture for bacterial versus a low or no pressure release from viral. Um, once that spinal fluid is sent to the lab, they are looking at that fluid to determine if there are white blood cells present. And so with bacterial meningitis, you're going to see a large number of white blood cells, as well as when you look at those white blood cells to differentiate what they are. Um, you're mostly going to see neutrophils, except there is with listeria, you would see a more predominant with lymphocytes, so that can kind of confuse you with viral. And so with viral, you do have a white blood cells present, but they're usually going to be a little bit lower in number. And with this one, you're going to see mostly lymphocytes. Additional testing would include uh, doing some chemistry testing where you're looking for protein and glucose within the spinal fluid. So you're checking um, those numbers. And they actually kind of use the patient's um, blood protein and glucose levels to help compare these as well. And so um, with viral, your glucose is going to be normal. We're going to have a higher protein. Um, whereas with bacterial, your glucose will be lower. Um, and this is actually because those organisms will sometimes use that glucose to kind of help thrive um, within the spinal fluid. So bacteria are rare cause of meningitis than viruses, but they can cause a more dangerous form because it can progress very quickly. So again, if you're going to do a culture, we already know it's going to take about 18, 24 hours for that culture to grow. So in most cases, you don't have time to wait to determine if that patient is going to need um, antibiotic. So um, Usually once a patient starts developing symptoms and they present for care, um, if meningitis is suspected, you are most likely the physician's going to start them on a broad spectrum antibiotic just because if it is bacterial, you know, it can lead to problems quickly. So you don't have time to wait on that culture. So that's where they will use some of the other testing methods. Um, as well as doing a gram stain on that spinal fluid. So they'll spin it down and concentrate it, do a gram stain to look for um, the presence of organisms. So more specifically, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, where you're looking for those gram negative organisms. Um, but you can also have other organisms to cause meningitis. Um, like with neonatal meningitis, the exposure of the bacteria from mom to baby for things like streptococcus, E. coli, listeria. Um, you can have haemophilus exposure, um, pneumococcal meningitis due to streptococcus, listeria meningitis. Um, and so with any of these, that initial gram stain and those initial um, body fluid counts or body fluid chemistry tests 
are going to be very pertinent into trying to hone in as to what the cause of the infection is so that you can properly treat the infection. So with newborns, you're typically going to see, again, group B strep, E. coli, listeria. Within infants and children, you're going to look at more your strep, pneumonia, Neisseria, Haemophilus infections. Adolescents, young adults, so kind of like our teenagers, college students, you're looking at Neisseria meningitis, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And then with older patients, you're looking at Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitis, and Listeria. With Haemophilus gram-negative bacteria, um, Haemophilus influenza type B is the most serious of the invasive type strands. And so you can have this as common um, normal microbacteria in healthy individuals that kind of progresses to a opportunistic type infection. Um, if it's left untreated, it's going to have pretty much 100% mortality rate. So early treatment is very essential in detecting and treating this particular organism. Neisseria meningitis is a gram-negative organism. Um, and of course it is transmitted through contact of um, a suspected host. So this is usually done through things like sharing food, kissing, living in crowded quarters. So this would be like your dorm rooms. Um, there are vaccines for this organism, and it's usually going to present with fever, chills, disorientation, confusion, agitation, headache, sensitivity to light, uh, pinpoint rash um, over the body, stiff neck and back. So that's usually one of the early indicators is that stiff neck, um, being able to bend that head forward and touch the chin to the chest. So that's kind of one of the hallmark signs is not being able to do that. And so with this organism, again, you want to detect it quickly. So doing that gram stain where you can get a result uh, usually within the hour of actually drawing that spinal fluid off that patient and then going ahead and starting treatment right away if you are suspecting um, meningitis or if the gram stain comes back showing you know gram gram negative um, organism or whatever the organism is if the gram stain comes back that it is um, if the gram stain comes back that it's indicative indicative of a bacterial infection then you'd want to go ahead and treat with an antibiotic that is known to treat that particular suspected organism. Streptococcus pneumoniae, again, it's gram-positive coxa. Um, and so it is the leading cause of most of the bacterial meningitis according to the National Institute of Health. And so with this organism, again, fever, chills, headache, confusion, that stiff neck, sensitivity to light, there are vaccines out there um, for this particular organism and because this organism does contain a capsule it does allow it to adhere to the mucosal membranes and which can cause it to evade phagocytosis and then it will produce a toxin that will start to um, lyse those phagocytic cells and then it will create an inflammation type response which allows the bacteria to have access to the blood and then from there it's able to penetrate that blood brain barrier which will cause the meningitis and so again for diagnosis you're looking for the presence of this organism in culture or looking for um, the presence of it on a gram stain and then there are also some various automated type testing where you're actually looking for the antigen to this organism um, to know how to treat it. Listeria, gram positive organism, is transmitted through contaminated food or through inner utero, so from mother to baby. Um, 
still some of the same symptoms and due to the small number of extracellular bacteria um, microscopic examination of the spinal fluid is not sufficient for diagnosis um, so you could actually miss these organisms if you're looking at a gram stain so you're not going to go just based off the gram stain um, so if the gram stain is to come back no organism seen you can't completely rule this out, so you would still need to follow through with cultural results and treating um, as though this patient is infected with a bacterial infection. Peripheral nervous systems um, can also become infected. And so with this one, we're looking at um, uh, something like leprosy. Um, and then you've also got some bacteria that have a pathogenic effect because of their toxins. So with these, we're looking at some of these neurotoxins that are produced that would be, that would cause botulism or tetanus. So with leprosy, we're looking for the mycobacterium leprae, which is an acid-fast bacteria. So you would need to, um, Definitely make sure that if you're suspecting this, that you are, um, the proper testing is performed. So you'd want to do an acid fast culture looking for um, this organism in an acid fast stain if you're doing observation on a direct specimen. And so with this a particular infection, it causes damage to the skin, the peripheral nerves, mucosal tissue in the eyes and respiratory tract. And if it does progress to a tuberculoid form, um, you can start having the skin plaques that will form due to those nerve endings or those nerve cells being infected. And so they can be a flattened, um, less pigmented area um, than what your non-infected skin would look like. And so then it would cause actual localized sensory loss to that infected area. Botulism is caused by gram-positive bacteria. And again, these organisms um, will produce toxins. And so it's the toxins itself that actually causes the um, paralysis. So with foodborne botulism, you've actually ingested that toxin, which causes a GI response. Um, to the presence of that toxin from that organism. And so we have seen botulism um, infections with wound infections as well as food infections. And with the um, toxins being produced, um, you can see them things like canned vegetables where those spores are still present and actually can cause germination of that organism and start producing that toxin which actually causes the symptoms and so you can actually have infant botulism in which those um, endospores are introduced into the gi tract of the infant um, uh, producing those toxins that actually cause that infection to that infant Tetanus, um, of course, we do have the tetanus shots now, but tetanus is caused by Clostridium tetanae, which is a gram-positive uh, rod-shaped anaerobic organism. And so it's found in soil and water. Um, and it can enter in through some sort of um, something like a puncture wound. And then from there, it'll travel to the peripheral nervous system where it um, invades those neurons um, and it can be transported to the spinal cord and then it will actually block the release of inhibitory um, neurotransmitters and then it um, prevents the muscles from actually relaxing and it causes that um, spastic paralysis or what we um, know as tetanus. 
You can have some fungal infections, even though they are rare. Um, you can see them in immunocompromised patients. And so this is because those spores that are found in dirt, air, water, can actually um, become an opportunistic type infection. So one of the more common ones that we see um, in a healthy person would be a cryptococcus. And so this is a fungus-like fun uh, yeast-like fungi that forms um, resistant spores, and it can affect the immunocompromise. And it can actually lead to death of patients who have HIV and AIDS. So cryptococcus, again, it is a fungal infection with cryptococcus that can be found in bird droppings. Um, it can lead to a cough, flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, agitation, disorientation. And so because they have that thick polysaccharide capsule, um, it kind of protects that organism from the normal immune response of the body. And then um, it can actually protect that fungus from the actual cells of the body, the neutrophils, and um, to prevent them from actually killing that organism. And so there are a few things that can be done. Culture, of course, can be done to grow this organism. Um, as well as looking under the microscope for the presence of cryptococcus in blood, sputum, spinal fluid. There are antigen tests, some rapid antigen type testing that can be performed. And um, if we're suspecting this organism, while some labs still do, um, most labs do some sort of antigen type testing, but you can still do the ND ink test where you're looking for that organism under the microscope and you're looking for the presence of that capsule, which kind of prevents that ink from actually surrounding that organism. So you'll see a little halo around it. There are a few parasitic organisms that can infect the nervous system. So these include toxoplasmosis, African sleep and sickness, primary amoebic meningeal encephalitis, craniotolomitis, amoebic encephalitis. Toxoplasmosis is transmitted foodborne through undercooked meats but it can also be uh, transmitted due to exposure to cat feces, um, where it's transmitted mother to fetus. So this is kind of where you hear about pregnant women not changing the litter box. Um, although most pregnant women, if they have a cat, they've already been exposed to this organism. Um, but due to the potential risk of um, being exposed to this organism. If you are pregnant, do you have a cat, you just need to take extra precautions just in case you've not been exposed to this organism before. So healthy people do tend to be asymptomatic, but they can have mild flu-like symptoms. Um, the reason why pregnant women want to avoid it is because you can have a Congenital toxoplasmosis, which can cause miscarriage, stillbirth, or neurological problems. With immunocompromised patients, they tend to have more symptoms than what a normal healthy individual would. So with toxoplasmosis, you can detect it through a couple of different methods. Um, immunoassay type testing, as well as PCR type testing. Um, and you can actually check the if it's suspected the amniotic fluid to see if this organism is present. Um, but for the most part, um, it can usually be self-limiting in healthy individuals. African sleeping sickness, which is caused by trypanosome bruti. Um, you have a couple of forms of it that can cause um, acute disease as well as chronic disease. These are typically found in Africa, these disease associations, but um, 
we can still see it here in the States due to a patient, uh, the patient having visited Africa, usually missionary trips. You can find patients that will come back home and have um, contracted this infection due to the tsetse fly, having bit them. So, um, and then that infection will kind of progress, cross the blood brain barrier, and cause um, central nervous system type response. So with these patients, they can present with fever, headaches, swollen lymph nodes. They can be asymptomatic initially, but then the symptoms kind of start to progress. And then there's a direct cytotoxic effect um, from the presence of this organism. And um, if it's left untreated, it can actually progress to uh, fatality. Primary amoebic and meningoencephalitis. Um, and so this is what we like to term our brain eating amoeba. Um, so with this organism, it can live in streams and lakes and then um, actually the patient will come in contact by swimming in waters that contain this. So they're usually stagnant waters. And um, the are by using water that's contaminated, like through a neti pot that's not been sterilized. And so it will actually enter the nasal passage um, due to that exposure. And then from there, it will actually roar its way until it actually reaches um, the nerves to actually enter into the brain. And then from there, it will cause the um, symptoms of like intense headaches, sore throat, vomiting, fever, stiff neck, seizures, hallucinations, coma, and then the patient can actually die within a week or two after the infection. Um, well, it's not that they can die, they, they usually do die. So um, it's almost always fatal. Um, and so a lot of times the it's found when, uh, with autopsy um, or through detection of the spinal fluid where you're looking for uh, the presence of that organism. Granutoluminous amoebic encephalitis. Um, so this can be caused by a cantamoeba. So it's very similar um, to the previous infection and it can progress within the host for a few months or uh, even to a couple of years without actually being recognized. And again, this one also is almost always fatal. So you know that any affection that is at the point of reaching the brain is going to cause serious, serious complications.